Good evening, everyone. We are so happy to have you back for the fourth night of the Angelman Syndrome Foundation Virtual Palooza. You are in for a treat tonight. We are so excited for, to have our guests. But before we get into that, just a couple of reminders. One, I want to thank everyone who has already signed up for our Angelman Syndrome Virtual Walk. The good news is it's not too late. We have an awesome event planned for you all, and it's not too late to sign up and get your t-shirt and your awesome bag and support the foundation. So if you haven't signed up, please do so. Also, tomorrow night, we will continue our virtual palooza, and we will have Dr. Becky Burdine that will be joining us to talk about all the genetics and all the fun stuff around AS. So um, please make sure you join for that session as well. We will take a couple day break and we'll jump back on Monday for a, a session around puberty in Angelman syndrome individuals. So we'll hope you, we hope you'll join us for that as well. You have the awesome opportunity to hear from an amazing individual tonight and ask any question that you want. If you can see on, the, on your screen, you have um, an ability to ask questions or you can ask questions in the chat. And if we have time, which I think we will, we'll get to as many questions as we can um, for Dr. Stormy Chamberlain tonight, but if not, she will also be able to address those questions in a PDF form and we'll get them to you afterwards. All these sessions are recorded and every week they will be uploaded so you can go back and watch them and use them as future resources. So, so no one wants to hear me talk anymore. We will jump right into it and I am so honored to introduce you to my dear friend and such a pioneer and a champion for individuals with Angelman syndrome. Dr. Stormy Chamberlain has been working in the Angelman um, syndrome space since her graduate years and probably even before and working really, really hard to find, uh, to research and find therapeutic treatments for, our, for individuals with Angelman syndrome. She also has served as the scientific advisory chair for our foundation, as well as a board member. So this amazing individual is dedicated to our kids and we're so lucky to have her. So please give a warm welcome and uh, give a big hug to our friend, Dr. Stormy Chamberlain. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and, and thanks everybody for attending. Thanks for taking the time to hear um, what I have to tell you tonight. So I'm gonna focus on research updates um, from the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, and we'll get right into it. Um, all right. So um, first and foremost, our research goal at ASF is to improve the lives of individuals with Angelman Syndrome. Um, and we try to view that, we try to view all of our research through that lens. Um, and so hopefully um, when I, as I tell you about our work, um, You'll, you, you can see um, how, how your kids with Angelman syndrome have really infiltrated everything we think about from the research side. Our uh, research funding philosophy, um, you know, I use a sports analogy. I use a lot of sports analogies, um, but, you know, really baseball is a great one. Um, we're, we're not interested in, in always swinging for the fence and always trying to hit a home run because, um, you know, as, as a good sports team knows, that doesn't work all the time. That's not how you win games. Um, and instead, um, we um, fund, first of all, studies to better understand UBE3A because if our home runs fall short, um, we can also learn a few things that get us further along in the process anyhow. Um, we do uh, fund high risk, high reward studies to find therapeutics, and these are viewed more like home runs, swinging for the fence, if you will. Um, and another important uh, uh, piece of our research puzzle is clinical studies that um, allow us to understand Angelman syndrome, but also improve the quality of life. Um, and so uh, ultimately we're after treatments and a cure, and I use cure in the broadest sense. We want to, we'd, we'd like to reduce the burden of, of Angelman syndrome um, and, and fix everything but the smile. But um, we also know your kids are wonderful as they are. Um, and so we want to fix the things that are the most pesky to you. So how do we fund research? Um, we prefer to fund research by, by uh, granting seed funding um, to generate preliminary data. 
And the idea is, is that we can put a little bit of money into a project and the promising studies, the ones that generate good and promising data could be further funded by larger organizations with deeper pockets like the NIH, Simons Foundation for Autism Research or pharma companies. And so uh, to give you an example, um, a $200,000 two year award to Dr. Mar Mark Zilka that we awarded in 2016 for her, his CRISPR studies, uh, resulted in a $2.8 million grant to him from the NIH in 2019. And I just learned of, uh, I think yesterday, I learned of another example. Um, one of Ben Philpott's former projects um, just earned him uh, a large grant from the Simons Foundation for Autism Research that was announced yesterday. And so we're very good at this, at, at, at um, leveraging the the monies that we invest in research um, and so you know um, they often end up in much larger grants towards Angelman syndrome research. Um, we require peer review of our grants. Um, any scientist or clinician can submit a grant application to the Angelman Syndrome Foundation and we review them. And so often what happens is we get experts in their particular area that have a great idea that they think could be applied to Angelman Syndrome and they come to us. We review these proposals twice a year and they're reviewed by our scientific advisory committee. And this uh, SAC uh, is comprised of 19 uh, members. Um, they're scientists, clinicians, and parents. Again, we try to keep um, your, your kids um, in our thoughts as we're thinking about funding. Um, and one of the criteria that we have in our, our funding sheet, our score sheet is um, impact um, for individuals with Angelman syndrome. The SAC reviews the grants individually, and then we meet by phone uh, to discuss the grants and provide a score and then recommend funding. So now I'm gonna tell you about specific research topics that um, ASF has funded over the past few years. But before I get there, I wanna make sure we all have the same lexicon to work from. Um, and so, you know, this might be boring for some of you and it might look a lot like um, high school biology, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm gonna be talking about cells. Um, and within a cell, there is a part called the nucleus. The nucleus is where the chromosomes are and the chromosomes, um, are comprised of DNA um, and DNA that's tightly packed. Um, and so specifically, um, the cells that we'll be talking about are neurons, which are brain cells. And so if I slip up and say neurons, that's, I mean, simply brain cells. The chromosome that we're after is chromosome 15. Um, and the piece of DNA we're most interested in is UBE3A. And I also will probably refer to UBE3A as a gene, as the DNA, um, but also as the protein. Um, and so DNA uh, is turned into RNA and that RNA is translated into a protein um, and, and they all bear the same name. So um, unlike most chromosomes, mom and dad's copy of chromosome 15 are different from one another. We all inherit a uh, one copy of each chromosome from our mom and one copy of each chromosome from our dad. And those two chromosomes are pretty much the same for almost every chromosome um, that we have. And chromosome 15 is, is one of very few exceptions to that. Um, and the chromosome 15 Q11 to Q13 region is where the UBE3A gene is located. And if we zoom in and we look more carefully at this region, um, you'll see a variety of different genes. Each box on here, on this diagram, represents one gene that's in the chromosome 15 Q11 to Q13 region. And some genes are made only from dad's copy of chromosome 15, those are shown in blue, and some are made only from mom's copy, and that's shown in red. And so UBE3A is really the only copy that's made um, from mom's copy alone. Um, how, this, how each cell remembers whether um, the chromosome is from mom or the chromosome is from dad, um, uh, that's determined by DNA methylation. And so many of you, when your child was diagnosed, you might've had a methylation test. And they're actually looking at the methylation here at the imprinting center. I diagrammed them as a white circle, a white lollipop at snurf snurf end, or a black lollipop. The black lollipop means methylation. Uh, means it's methylated and white means it's unmethylated. And that's how the cell tell, tells itself which one's from dad and which one, one's from mom. Mom's copy always is methylated. So when mom's copy is missing, you're left with only an unmethylated piece of DNA. 
and that's what's used uh, to diagnose. Um, but when mom's copy is missing, for UBE3A, um, it's not made at all because dad's copy of chromosome 15 doesn't express UBE3A. It can't make UBE3A. And so that's, um, that's wherein lies the problem in Angelman syndrome. So there are four common ways. I use common in quotations because it's still a rare disorder, um, but there are, uh, most of your kids can be grouped into one of four different types, um, uh, four different types of Angelman syndrome. Um, so in the first case here, so the top panel are um, the diagrams that you might see um, from our website, um, from the ASF genetics section of the um, angelman.org website. And the bottom is, I think, a more simplified visual um, for what this means. I'm kind of a visual person, and so I tried to present it two ways um, in case one sticks with you a little bit better. So in typical individuals, they have one copy of chromosome 15 from dad and one copy from mom. Um, I showed those with blue and red chromosomes at the bottom. Uh, almost 70% of your kids have a deletion. Um, and this number is approximate. This deletion means they're missing the entire 15Q11 to Q13 region. It's about a four to six megabase deletion um, uh, for those of you who have that. And it's on mom's copy of chromosome 15. Um, the other way is another way is UBE3A mutation. And that means that the UBE3A gene itself has a mutation. It can be as small as a single base pair, a single DNA letter that does this. It accounts for about 10 to 15% of Angelman cases. And again, this mutation occurs on mom's copy of chromosome 15 um, in your child. Um, uniparental disomy means that um, both chromosomes 15 come from dad. Um, and so they're diagrammed here in blue. And because there's no mom copy, no red copy of UBE3A, um, that causes Angelman syndrome. And the final um, type is the imprinting defect. And in this case, um, a child has a chromosome 15 from mom and a chromosome 15 from dad, but mom's copy behaves as if it were inherited from dad. And so it's kind of, I gave it this checkerboard appearance here. Um, it behaves as if it were inherited from dad and it doesn't express UBE3A. So those are the four um, uh, genotypes um, for Angelman syndrome. So with that in mind, um, we recognize that each of you have gone through a diagnostic odyssey um, to diagnose your child. Um, some of you found out pretty quickly. Some of you took several years to get a diagnosis for your child. And it breaks my heart on Facebook when I, I um, hear you struggle with um, scheduling the appointments and whatnot to, to get this diagnosis. Um, and so uh, a couple of years ago, um, ASF co-funded research to develop a newborn screen for Angelman syndrome. And it wasn't just Angelman syndrome. So taking advantage of, of the DNA methylation, not only can you diagnose Angelman syndrome, but you can diagnose most cases of Prader-Willi syndrome and most cases of DUP15Q syndrome. And so Dr. David Godler developed an inexpensive test um, that's ideal for this newborn screening. And we partnered um, our funding, we, part, we, we are co-funding this with the Foundation for Prader-Willi Research, as well as the DUP15Q Alliance. And so by working together, um, we can have a bigger impact um, for things like newborn screening. So you might wonder what does UBE3A do then and, and why is it such a big deal that it's missing? So UBE3A is what's known as a ubiquitin ligase. Um, it's a big word that simply means um, it sticks a small molecule called ubiquitin onto proteins, other proteins, and that targets them to the trash can. Um, and, and so it, its job is really to to take that ubiquitin molecule and to take, identify which protein it's going to move it to and physically move it to that new protein. And then once it gets a chain of these ubiquitin molecules, the protein can go to the garbage can. And the garbage can is actually called the proteasome. So that's what the protein does. Um, and, you know, kind of like this diagram shows, there's there's a couple of different pieces of this, right? You have to be able to take, UBE3A has to be able to take the ubiquitin in the first place. It also has to choose the protein that it's moving the ubiquitin to, and then it has to physically move the ubiquitin over. It has to do this over and over again. Um, and so 
one of the questions um, we thought was important to ask and we funded was how do different mutations in UBE3A cause Angelman syndrome? And so kind of like a car, a car's job is to get you from point A to point B, but there's a lot of moving parts on your car. There's an engine, there's a transmission, there's tires. Um, the same thing happens with UBE3A. There's a few moving parts on UBE3A. There's a Azul domain, there's a HEC domain. So there's different pieces of the protein that have different functions. So what Jason Yi at Washington University in St. Louis um, has proposed to do and we funded um, is to catalog all of the UBE3A mutations that cause Angelman syndrome and determine how they disable the protein function. Do they do it by making the ligase activity not work? Do they do it by making the protein self-destruct, if you will? Um, and by identifying areas where mutations have an unusually large impact um, on UBE3A function, um, we can start to understand what are the most important pieces of the protein. But they'll also, importantly, um, aid in interpretation of genetic tests for the diagnosis of Angelman syndrome. So some of you out there have may have gotten a test from a doctor with a uh, UBE3A mutation, and the doctor can't determine whether that is a, um, a disease-causing mutation or not. Um, and so that's one of the important um, outcomes of this type of research. Um, another study we funded recently was Dr. Gilles Travé um, in France. And um, his work is trying to determine the three-dimensional structure of full-length UBE3A. And believe it or not, despite the fact that we've studied this protein for many years, um, I think 20, 20 to 25 years, um, we still don't know this, the full-length structure. And furthermore, he wants to do this with and without another protein called HERC2. So HERC2 is another gene um, in the 15Q11 to Q13 region. It's just a couple doors down from UBE3A. And what we know about it is it, it is also um, a ubiquitin ligase, and it binds to UBE3A um, and can change how well it works. And so he wants to know what's the structure of UBE3A alone? What is it with? with HERC2 attached to it, and what are the proteins that interact with it so that we can better understand um, how this whole ubiquitin ligase thing works. Um, and this is important for understanding exactly how UBE3A does its job um, and whether HERC2 is impacting it. Um, and, and so, you know, your children who have deletions um, uh, that are deletion positive, um, they not only lack UBE3A, but they're missing one of the copies of HERC2, and we're kind of curious whether this contributes to the severity um, of, of kids with uh, deletions. And this work, I should have mentioned it here, is also co-funded with the Duke 15 q Alliance, again, stretching our dollars and making them do more work for us. Um, another question we've asked in research is, where in the cell is UBE3A? Um, and so, in this diagram here, you can see a cell. I, I talked earlier about the nucleus, but there's other pieces to the cell, the um, mitochondria that are the powerhouse and, and the um, cytoplasm, which is the, the soup that the uh, cell, that the nucleus is floating in. Um, and Dr. Ipe Elgersma um, started to work on this and asking where is it in a cell, because that might tell us what does the what does UBE3A doing? For instance, if it's in the nucleus, it might be acting on DNA in some way and changing gene expression. Whereas if it's in the cytoplasm, it's working on these other proteins and other um, functions that are outside here in the soup. And so what IPA found was that there are two different forms of UBE3A in the mouse, and it looks like they may be located in different parts of the cell. The short form, he thinks, is primarily localized in the nucleus by the DNA, and the long form may be out here in the cytoplasm in the soup. And interestingly, the short form in mice accounts for about 80% of the total UBE3A protein, and he published that this year um, in a very nice article. Um, we don't always stop at the mouse. Um, we often look in humans. And so um, work from my lab and Ben Philpott's lab, um, we've looked at um, where human UBE3A is. Ben's group did this um, with Alan Barrett, looking at um, brain slices and asking where is UBE3A in, in, in um, slices from post-mortem brain. And um, I did this looking, my lab did this looking at um, neurons made from Angelman syndrome stem cells. And what we asked, um, so human 
uh, UBE3A protein looks very similar to that in the mouse, but actually there are three different forms in human. And their location may vary, may be slightly different from the mouse isoforms. And most notably, we see a little bit more in the cytoplasm in the soup of the human neurons. And so that might be important um, to how uh, UBE3A functions. And what's really cool is, is that, um, you know, scientists don't do a good job of um, telling you that sometimes we disagree with each other um, a little bit, or sometimes we don't know all the answers. Um, and ultimately, we keep trying to work it out. And we keep trying to do more experiments to find the real answer. And, um, and we're interested in finding the real answer, not to prove ourselves right. And so, um, you know, this is kind of one of those great debates that's going on in science right now. And, um, and we, hope, um, we hope to learn more about UBE3A through this debate. Um, so I, I told you a little bit about our studies. You know, those studies were um, to better understand UBE3A. And there's a lot more that ASF has done. Um, so this is just things that we funded in the past couple of years. So now I'm going to move on to um, the high risk, high reward studies to find therapeutics. So um, if you head over to the Angelman Clinical Trials website, um, you can see a um, diagram that tells you the therapeutic pipeline, the current Angelman syndrome therapeutic pipeline, and where um, different uh, uh, drugs are um, within this pipeline and the companies that are developing them. And so I'm going to talk about um, and talk about these in two different groups. I'm first going to talk about the gene therapies and the activation strategies, and then I'll come back and talk about the um, symptomatic and, and uh, improving neuronal function strategies. Um, ASF has funded um, activities in both. So first with gene therapy, gene therapy is probably the most straightforward way to restore UBE3A. We can simply put back the gene that's missing in Angelman syndrome. And so the idea here is, is that you might take a healthy gene, a healthy UBE3A gene, stick it into a virus vector. Um, it's a virus in which we've taken out all the virus genome um, and replaced it with UBE3A. Um, and then you can take that virus vector with the healthy gene and um, introduce it into individuals with a disorder. And, um, and those individuals will then make uh, the UBE3A that they're missing. So ASF funded the first studies of gene therapy back in 2005 and 2007. Um, but um, I'll tell you about a more recent study in 2017. Um, ASF funded uh, Dr. Steve Gray at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in collaboration with Dr. Ben Philpott. Um, and this strategy, again, puts, the U, puts UBE3A back and is being further developed by AskBio um, in North Carolina. But AskBio isn't the only company working on this. The same approach is being pursued by PTC Therapeutics, uh, the UPenn Orphan Disease Center, and potentially others. And what's really cool is that each of these companies come at it from slightly a different angle. Um, and so it's giving you guys more shots on goal of making sure that you get the best therapeutic for your kid. So how much UBE3A do we have to put back? Um, so some interesting work um, by uh, Drs. Anjali uh, Sadwani and Dr. Wenhan Tan at Boston Children's Hop Hospital, and, and they're um, members of our uh, scientific advisory committee. Um, as part of their natural history study, they identified two families with a mutation that disrupts one form of UBE3A protein. And what's interesting is, is that the three kids in, this, in these two families um, are, strong, are less strongly affected um, than most individuals with Angelman syndrome. These individuals have uh, phrase speech, they speak in phrases, and they have much improved motor skills. And um, I told you earlier about some studies from um, the Elgarzma lab and, and my lab that suggest that um, these individuals might have about 12 to 18 percent of typical UBE3A levels. They're missing this short isoform, this isoform 1. Um, and that's, again, about 80% of the total protein. So they have, you know, 12 to 18% of typical UBE3A levels. And what that tells us is, is that if you have a small amount of UBE3A protein, um, there's a good chance that you'll have a substantially improved, um, uh, perhaps, speech and, and motor skills. And so um, these two things worked together to tell us um, a little bit about how much UBE3A protein we need. Now, we don't know um, whether this works if um, only 50% of the neurons in the brain get 
UBE3A or whether all of the neurons have to have that. And that's something else that needs to be worked out. But um, these again, give us more information to move forward. Um, another question we've asked is, is too much UBE3A bad? Um, and this is where, again, collaboration is so important. Kids with DO15Q syndrome uh, have one or two extra copies um, of the same genetic region, have one or two extra copies of UBE3A. And early studies, as well as uh, genetics, um, suggest that this excess UBE3A is important for many aspects of DOOP15Q syndrome. Um, and so we've collaborated with the DOOP15Q Alliance to study what happens when there's too much UBE3A and what happens with, um, in, in the case of DOOP15Q when we reduce UBE3A levels. And Ben Philpott's lab has made mice with extra copies of UBE3A. Um, and so these are really important to help us understand the consequences of having too much UBE3A. And so we collaborate again with DO15Q Alliance. We even share a research conference every other year to make sure that, um, that we're keeping this in mind as well. So I'm gonna move on to the um, activation strategies now. Um, but before I get there, um, I need to explain a little bit more science. Um, so every child with Angelman syndrome has an intact copy of UBE3A, um, but it's silenced. It's this copy that's sitting on dad's copy of chromosome 15. And if we could find a way to turn it on, um, there wouldn't, you, you most likely wouldn't have an overexpression problem. And so, um, uh, back in 2009, ASF funded a study in Ben Philpott's lab that first proved that paternal UBE3A could be activated. Um, and, and so with that in mind, um, a lot of other work ensued. So in 2011, ASF funded Dr. Art Baudet to better understand how this happens. And so the way um, that this happens is, is that there is an RNA called antisense transcript and it's called UBE3A ATS, it's up here in red. Um, and it runs opposite to UBE3A as the genes are made. And what this is like is it's like two trains on the same track and they crash. And it seems like the antisense transcript always wins and it kicks UBE3A off the track. And so a lot of ARTS work um, or that was ASF funded early on and NIH funded uh, subsequently um, helped us better understand how this happens. And so um, in the work of uh, Ben Philpott that contributed to this idea was um, he first showed that this uh, drug called topotecan um, could prevent the antisense from being made. Um, it stops the antisense from being made at all. And ASF funded a recent study in 2017 um, where Ben has identified additional small molecule activators that work by a, a different but yet unknown mechanism. And uh, this exciting technology has been licensed by Pinnacle Hill and is being developed um, in collaboration with Ben's lab um, to test to see whether these would be good therapeutic options uh, for Angelman syndrome. Uh, ASF also funded a CRISPR strategy. And so this CRISPR strategy that was developed by Mark Zilka at UNC, um, CRISPRs are small, it's really a, a small RNA as well as a protein. And this small RNA drags the protein, uh, the Cas9 protein or the CRISPR protein, if you will, to one specific spot on the DNA. And, it's, and um, in this particular case, it serves as a stop sign. It really physically stops the antisense train. Um, what's kind of cool is, is that CRISPR, in this case, does not need to cut the DNA, and so that's a safer therapeutic approach. And uh, the other cool feature of this is that it can be delivered, um, again, using viral vectors like gene therapy. Um, and so this could be delivered perhaps even before birth if it was needed, and if that was shown to be beneficial, we could deliver it before birth um, to stop the antisense and allow dad's copy of UBE3A to, to be turned on. Um, and probably the most popular strategy right now are antisense oligos. Um, these ASOs, uh, they cut the antisense RNA. And when you cut the RNA, uh, it causes some downstream things to happen that derails the antisense train. And so this train um, will, this train 
leaves the track. Um, and that allows the UBE 3A train to finish its job and make the protein. Um, and ASF first funded this work um, in Art Baudet's lab to investigate this process in mouse. And later on, it funded a project in my lab to investigate this in human neurons, which led to, the, um, to finding human sequences uh, that could do the same thing. And this is how the therapeutics um, that are now being developed by genetics, Roche, and Ionis all work. They all cut the antisense transcript um, and allow UBE3A to be made in that manner. Um, understanding that you just simply need to cut the RNA, um, Dr. Noel Germain in my lab um, found another method uh, to cut the antisense that also seems to activate UBE3A shown in gray here. Um, and these are shRNAs. Uh, shRNA stands for short hairpin RNAs. They cut RNA at a specific sequence. And so it really only works um, on UBE3A. Um, they cut the antisense and activate paternal UBE3A. And they too can be delivered by AAV, um, like gene therapy, for one and done type treatments. And so what it is, is you get the benefits of ASOs, but with the um, durability of a gene therapy, they, they might last a very long time. And so this was current, this is recently licensed um, by um, Ovid Therapeutics. So there's still a lot of questions remaining about restoring UBE3A. Um, and this, this is also applies to gene therapy. Which form of UBE3A is going to be the best for maximal benefit? Remember that there are three in humans. Um, what are the expectations for recovery um, based on when we put the protein back? Um, so how early do we have to, um, do we have to deliver it? Um, do we need to target the whole brain or is only one region sufficient? Um, what percentage of the neurons must be, a, a, it must be infected or must receive UBE3A in order to see a benefit? Um, and what are the dangers of too much UBE3A and how do we um, limit the chances of this? And so these are questions that scientists still ask and we're looking for proposals that address some of these questions because they're very important questions to move forward in, in therapeutics. Um, we also fund work to enable clinical trials. Um, ASF funded work on a mouse model that allows UBE3A to be restored at different times during development. And this was done in um, Ipeal Gersma's lab. Um, and this helps us to determine the best time during development, during a lifespan, uh, to put UBE3A back for the best um, for the best outcomes. And so in briefly what, what IPA found was is that if you restore UBE3A at any age in mice, um, you can restore um, the cellular processes that are um, responsible for learning and memory. Uh, if you restore it in adolescence, you actually restore uh, the rotor rod task, which may very well be motor skills or balance. Um, and so there's uh, some uh, ability to restore that later in development. But some of the tasks like open field and marble berry nest building, which we're not quite sure how these equate to human tasks, um, but they really need to be restored. Uh, you, you have to have UBE3A back very early in development to see these tasks uh, corrected. And so it's important, on one hand, it's, it's a little sad to know that, you, that it doesn't seem like we can fix everything um, in, in everybody, but what's kind of cool is, is this allows us to make the argument um, to the FDA and whatnot that um, putting UBE3A back early on is, is a great idea and is gonna provide the most benefit. Um, ASF also funded work to study um, an EEG biomarker in Angelman mice, um, in mice and humans. Um, these biomarkers allow us to determine whether or not therapeutics are working. And so specifically they found um, pieces of the EEG that are different um, and specific to Angelman syndrome in both mouse and humans. Um, and, and so that'll be important as therapeutics are tested. Um, so one of the other projects that we fund, we've recently funded, are is a project to determine which cells in the brain make or need UBE3A. And so um, this project in, in from uh, Ipe Algerzma's lab also um, asks the question of, does the loss of UBE3A in the striatum 
cause many of the symptoms of Angelman syndrome. The striatum is a little region close to the hippocampus here. Um, and it's involved in motor learning, speech, emotional regulation, and cognition. And, and as you all know, a lot of these are, are um, affected in your kids. And so, um, so he took this hypothesis and is now testing this in mice um, because it would be great to know if we have to reach the striatum to fix a lot of the benefits, we're going to focus on therapeutic approaches that might hit the striatum. Um, Another approach that is asking a very similar question is being taken by uh, Ben Philpott. Um, and what Ben has done is, is uh, at UNC, they have already collected brain samples from non-human primates, um, rhesus macaque monkeys, across different stages of their lifespan from embryonic development through adulthood. And he's taken these monkeys that were already collected for a different reason, the brain slices, and asked, where is, he's asking, where is UBE3A found? Um, which brain regions and which cell types within these brains during development does, do you see UBE3A? Because that tells us where UBE3A is naturally. Um, and this would be important to understand where we might want to deliver the therapeutics as well. It's asking a similar question to EPES, but taking a slightly different approach. And once again, it's really important to hedge our bets in science and make sure we're asking the questions in a couple of different ways um, to make sure we get an answer and can move forward. Um, and another study we funded um, are biomarkers of language in Angelman syndrome. Um, you know, uh, families have told us that communication is very important and it's one of the toughest parts of Angelman syndrome. Um, so we'd like to identify biomarkers of language function so that um, we can measure improvement in language um, after a therapeutic intervention. And so this study that uh, uh, was proposed by Dr. Charlotte DeStefano and uh, Dr. Shafali Just um, at UCLA, um, they're studying brain responses to different aspects of language processing. And so um, they can see how, how uh, your children's brains are interpreting language in different ways. And so these are objective ways to measure improvement in language that, that aren't asking you to fill out yet another survey um, to tell them how well your child's understanding something. And um, uh, these two Clinicians also work a lot with DUP15Q kids. Um, this is a little girl with DUP15Q um, for which they've uh, done a similar type of study. So that was a, 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 a small taste of our high risk, high reward studies to find therapeutics and, and to um, help deliver them um, to the clinic. Um, but another aspect of um, ANGEL, ASF research um, are the clinical studies that help us understand the disorder and help us improve the quality of life. Um, we we um, understand that not everyone will want to try these some of these more invasive therapeutics, um, and and they, and frankly, they might not be able to for for various reasons. And so we still think that it's important to try to improve their life as well and to give them um, treatments and and a cure, um, however whatever that might mean to them. And so. Um, Fortunately for us, um, and, and I've, I've alluded to this already, um, we know a lot of the different neurological functions that are affected in Angelman syndrome, thanks to the, the um, excellent work of um, many of the clinicians um, that see your kids. And so we know about their cognitive and motor skills and language development, and, and I, you guys could have written the book on this, I'm sure. Um, and fortunately for us, the same types of phenotypes um, are present in mice. Um, and we have ways of measuring them. And that's thanks to scientists like um, Ipel Gersma and Ben Philpott and um, Art Baudet, who uh, look at these, and, and Ed Weber, um, who look at these um, phenotypes. And so the one thing that we haven't been able to study well in mice is language. So ASF, uh, just funded a study recently um, from Dr. Holly Fitch at the University of Connecticut. Um, she wants to determine the brain circuitry that, it's, that are requ required for the reduced communication in Angelman syndrome mice. Her preliminary data, so first of all, she found that the um, Angelman mice have 
significantly fewer vocalizations compared to their typical uh, litter mates. Um, but she also thinks that it involves motor circuitry. It doesn't correlate with um, deficits in, um, lang in auditory processing or social skills or cognition, and, but it does correlate with the motor skills delays. And um, so what Holly thinks is that, as, is, um, is that motor circuitry is involved um, and she's setting out to test this hypothesis. Um, and this is an important study because if we can understand the parts of the brain that are involved in the speech and language disorder in Angelman syndrome, um, it kind of can give us a better idea of the therapeutic window for improving it. Um, for instance, when do we have to put UBE3A back to restore language? And if we can um, study this in a mouse, it makes it a lot easier um, to take an educated guess um, when looking in your kids. We've also studied communication um, in humans. Uh, so we funded um, Dr. Mole and Dr. Sennett, um, uh, two separate studies, but both focused on um, training parents and caregivers to use and model um, AAC. Um, and the idea, we again, we funded two different studies to do this because we want to find the best way to improve communication. Um, and, and in both of these cases, um, the goal is to create a successful communication training program that families can replicate at home. And this is a way in which ASF research is really um, impactful directly to the patients and, and gives you hopefully some things that can improve quality of life in the near future. Um, another recent study, we've asked the question of do individuals with Angelman syndrome have cortical visual impairment or CVI? And this study was proposed by Dr. Karen Erickson at UNC. Um, CVI is a type of vision impairment that may affect balance, walking, communication, and, and behaviors. Um, and it is not known um, how frequently and how severe it is in Angelman syndrome. And it's important to understand whether your kids have this um, because it may impact communication and it may help us better understand um, what's causing so many of their, of their difficulties. Um, and once again, this will feed into telling us which pieces of the brain are going to be the most important for restoring UBE3A or, or for developing therapeutics to, to uh, correct, um, to, to be the most impactful. Um, another aspect that we um, try to fund are um, ways to fix neuron dysfunction. So, I told you a lot about studies to put UBE3A back, but the other thing we could do is try to fix what's wrong with the neurons. Um, and so, and, and I mean from a physiology standpoint. So if we know that neurons, for instance, aren't firing the way they're supposed to, if we can intervene in that firing process, that might also be an important therapeutic and might be more likely to help older individuals with Angelman syndrome. And so one example of this is a study we funded um, to Dr. Kiyoshi Igawa um, at Hokkaido University in Japan. Um, he has for a long time studied um, a, a, a process called tonic inhibition. And we know that Angelman neurons have deficits in tonic inhibition. And these are the mechanisms that keep neurons responsive to signals from other neurons. And uh, OV101, um, that's a, a compound being developed by um, Ovid Therapeutics, it's also called Gaboxidol, it corrects the deficits in tonic inhibition. Um, and so we funded Dr. Igawa to further study this to understand which brain regions and processes are impacted by uh, tonic inhibition so that we can understand um, how much, what different pieces of Angelman syndrome, um, we would expect to be uh, corrected by OV101, but also which pieces of the brain um, have this deficit to start with, so we can think of other ways to intervene. And we've also tested um, uh, cannabidiol, CBD, in a mouse model. Um, and you might ask, why would we do this? Because a lot of you guys are already using CBD. Well, the reason we decided to fund this study was precisely because so many of you are using CBD. Um, there was anecdotal evidence that it provides relief from seizures and other uh, issues in some individuals with Angelman syndrome, but the CBD that, that you typically buy isn't 
well controlled for the dose and the purity um, and, and whatnot. And so it's kind of important to understand um, how exactly it works um, and to learn as much as we can about it before um, recommending that anybody gives this to their child. So uh, Dr. Paul Carney um, at the University of North Carolina, um, along with Ben Philpott, tested this in a mouse model. And they found that CBD can reduce the seizure severity in a mouse model, but at high doses can cause a mild sedative effect. Um, and this is important to understand that this drug can also be sedating. Um, and testing this carefully is important for determining the parameters for future clinical trials. Um, so there can be evidence-based um, studies that, that um, help prove that CBD, prove whether CBD is, is effective or not. Um, more broadly, um, ASF research uh, helps fund um, the 15Q clinic network. Um, and this is an important uh, research tool for us. Um, so first of all, I know you've all heard about the 15Q clinics, the A Angelman clinics um, throughout the country and, and world. There are 21 such clinics, um, 18 in the States, um, along with one in Buenos Aires, one in um, Israel, and one in uh, the Netherlands. Um, they provide um, expert clinical care um, by physicians who are experienced treating kids with Angelman syndrome. But they also provide um, important research data. And so when you consent to release um, your clinical information for, for research purposes, um, it allows scientists to ask questions of large numbers of individuals uh, with Angelman syndrome. And again, um, this is a collaboration with the Do 15 q Alliance because together we can do more than either of us can do individually. And that's been really important for research and will be more and more important going forward, especially um, as therapeutics um, are being tested. Um, related to that is the Ladder database. Um, Ladder links um, multiple sources of clinical information from research. Um, the acronym um, is the top bullet point here. But um, what the study does is it, uh, study, a database does, um, is it combines data from the 15Q clinics network, um, the Angelman syndrome natural history study um, that's uh, housed at uh, Boston Children's Hospital right now with Wen Han Tan, um, the data from ASF and Duke 15Q Alliance registries where appropriate, as well as the Global Angelman Syndrome Registry. And so we take all these data and put them into one place. Um, and then that is really valuable for uh, scientists as well as pharmaceutical companies uh, to help them know um, what pieces of Angelman Syndrome um, can they correct and what does Angelman Syndrome look like before it's treated. Um, and this uh, database, the development of this database was uh, led by RTI International. Um, and supported by the ASF, Do15Q Alliance, and, and many different industry partners that are um, helping develop this really important research tool. And so I, I hope that by this short tour of ASF research, um, I hope you can get a glimpse of how we really are keeping our research goal in mind to improve the lives of individuals with Angelman syndrome. Um, we try to carefully look at all of the different aspects, whether it's basic research into understanding UBE3A, it's coming up with treatment strategies, or it's um, doing uh, investigating the, the clinical features and, and clinical interventions that, that um, might help your kids the most. We really do try to keep your kids at, at heart. Um, and in doing so, though, we, I think we've done some really impactful things. And I think with that, um, I can open it up to questions. Yeah, so um, Stormy, thank you so much. Um, I Every time I listen to you, I learn something more. And I someone had made a comment around that they wish that um, their high school teacher spoke in the way that you did because they probably would have learned more in their classes. Um, so I just um, thank you for, uh, you know, helping out and helping explain not only the, you know, the importance of the research that's being funded, but how that all fits into the, into this puzzle, right? Because there is so much that's needed to be researched and so many things to be, th to think about when it comes to our individuals with Angelman syndrome. And it's great to know that we have amazing researchers that are thinking about that. We do have several questions 
Wonderful. And we have about, uh, we have a few minutes. So I'm gonna try to get through as many as I can. They're coming in pretty quickly here. So yeah. um, we'll just, we'll just start if that's okay. And I'm gonna um, ask for forgiveness ahead of time. I'm horrible at pronunciating things. Stormy knows this about me. So Stormy will know what I'm, I'm saying. So hopefully I will get these words right. <laughs> So uh, one question that we had is, how far out is your lab from human clinical trials with the H S H S H R N A S? Oof. Um, <laughs> if you can I have, say. I have no idea, to be honest, because, um, you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces uh, for that. Uh, and so I, I, I couldn't even hazard a guess, really. Um, science is moving faster and faster, and so it surprises me how fast it moves. Yeah, absolutely. Is there, um, is the, I think it's methylation screening available in hospitals now is the question. Yeah, so um, I think you're referring to the newborn screening for methylation and it's not yet available. Um, there's pretty stringent uh, requirements that they have to stick to to qualify it for newborn screening plus uh, individual states in the US have to add uh, that, mm -hmm. They have to pay for it. Um, and so there's a lot of moving parts again um, to getting newborn screening to your kids. But the first step is having an assay that works well and is uh, inexpensive enough to even be considered. And so that's um, that's kind of where we're at, at the pro in the process. Uh, and so do you have to worry about an individual with the UPD transmission having too high a level of UBE3A with these therapeutics, for example, cutting and stopping the UBE3A? Yes. Um, so we do know that it is possible. We've tested this empirically. We, we've done it in the lab. Um, we do know it is it is possible to overexpress UBE3A, but what we don't know is, is do they make so much that it changes behavior or that it's bad for them. So those will be important studies going forward. And it's why I think a lot of pharmaceutical companies are being careful um, in, in not treating individuals with UPD or imprinting defect just yet, because they wanna make sure it's safe uh, in the first place. And I think it's wonderful that they're being so careful. Um, I know they're interested in treating your kids and I know they'll find a way it's possible it works. Um, they just need to be a little, they're just trying to be very careful to do no harm. Um, and so, so bear with them and have patience and understand that they have your kid's best interest in heart as it takes a little time to do. Absolutely. So this is a, a clinic question, but I think it's a great question for everyone. The question is, my daughter is 19 years old and she has never been seen in an AS clinic. In what way will she benefit from going to one of these clinics? And she's deletion positive. I, I mean, if you want to add some value to that, I can talk about that as well. But if you want to go ahead and answer your, I, I, from your view. Yeah. You know, from my point of view, um, I, I see um, the the nuanced expertise of the physicians that see your kids at an ASF clinic. And so first of all, the first of, first and foremost, um, the reason you should go is to connect with those doctors who already know so much about Angelman syndrome and to get that, that really expert care. Um, and there might be ways that they can improve your daughter's quality of life, just that they've learned through experience with so many different individuals with Angelman syndrome. But I'd also like to throw in there that um, by taking your child to an ASF clinic, um, you are also um, helping us in research land um, and helping people better understand the disorder in general um, by having your kids seen by these physicians and, and, and potentially agreeing to have some of your data used for, for research studies. Um, everybody's very careful about um, privacy and and uh, um, and not anonymity when when using data for research but um, it's it's super important to participate in trials whether it's the natural history study or other studies that are available that just helps us helps everybody um, learn more about the disorder so yeah and I, I would add as well I think that you know uh, people ask me this question all the time like if my child is doing really well and we love our care where we're at is there a benefit from going to the clinic I would say from what Stormy just said the latter part providing you know providing being being a part of the clinics gives us research but I also think that it's 
it's always great to have like these individuals really working with your children. It's also the front line of where all these clinical trials are happening as well. So it's a really good way for you to keep, keep engaged and involved. But the good thing is, is this clinic network is also working on um, different sorts of white papers, standards of care, things that you can use if you can't get it to a clinic. So if your child is uh, really suffering with seizures, you can print off this paper that says, this is the best way to treat seizures and take it to your home, you know, your neurologist. So there's ways that we're working around that to be able to support your families that you'll hear more about in the coming weeks. Well, and these clinicians are also coming up with research questions, yeah. you know, like, yep. um, you know, I, I remember not so long ago um, talking about um, myoclonus, the tremors um, yeah. in adults with Angelman syndrome. And that happens because physicians see a lot of adults. And, and so when they see your kid, they also come up with new research questions uh, that help push scientists to come up with better strategies to treat adults with Angelman syndrome. Um, so it, it, it helps for a lot of different reasons. Absolutely. So one of the questions is about the study that's happening that will be happening at UCLA with Dr. Charlotte De, um, De Stefanano if it's open yet, and if they're going to be asking for children. And I can let you know that right now it's not open. They're uh, they're they're ready to go, but the unfortunate um, aspect of COVID is delaying that study a little bit. If that is that correct, Stormy? That's correct. Um, I'm not even. I'm not even 100% sure the funding has gone through just yet. Um, it takes universities a little bit of time. That was one that was funded this most recent round. Um, and so it takes a little time there too. But um, once they open, they'll move pretty quickly. Um, I know they are already doing a lot of these techniques um, for other disorders. So, so um, I know this is kind of uh, your opinion question, but is it a question that comes out up a lot, right? And the question is, what do you think is the magic age that our kids need to receive therapeutics in order to be benefic beneficial? So I don't think that there's a magic age. And, and like Amanda said, it's, it's, it's a my opinion thing, right? Um, because uh, if anybody tells you that they know, they're lying. <laughs> um, this is one of those things where so we just don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't think, my opinion is, is I don't think that there's going to be a magic age. I think it's going to have um, in general, more benefit earlier, but um, I'm intrigued by EPA's results that say that you can fix the pieces that underlie cognition at any age. Um, and so there may very well be benefit in, in even adults with Angelman syndrome. Um, I just don't know what that would look like. And I think it's going to be hard to figure out what that looks like. But um, I'm cautiously optimistic that there's going to be benefits for a lot of different individuals. That's always a hard question to answer, right? I mean, because we want to say yes, like, and we just, like you said, we just don't know. And the good thing is, is research is moving along so quickly and so rapidly right now, even within the first year of me being in this position, it's amazing to see the advances that have happened just within the last year, right? Right. Well, and, and there's new studies, right? I think Ben Philpott's group showed that um, you could rescue seizures with by reinstating UBE3A in adolescence. Uh, and so that's, you know, that argues that, you know, later treatment, um, I, I'm, I'm not as happy to make the same parallels between mouse and human that a lot of folks are. I think it takes humans a long time to develop. And so I try to keep that in mind um, as yeah. well. But we keep learning more and more um, through through doing studies. So yeah, absolutely. So this is a question, um, and I, I don't, I'm sure you'll be able to answer, I'm not sure, but the question is, I have four kids. My youngest is 19 with deletion positive. Is there any chance that my other kids may have kids of their own with Angelman syndrome? Um, highly unlikely. Um, and so if your child is deletion positive, um, if, you're, if your angel is deletion positive and they have the common breakpoints and not something called a translocation, um, there's virtually no chance that your your typical children uh, would have a child with Angelman syndrome. The one exception to this is if there's a translocation, that can be inherited and it may look like a deletion um, when they first look. But um, in general, translocations are super rare. So in general, there's probably not much of a chance that, that that's the case. Ask your geneticist though. That's why you 
Again, go to an Angelman syndrome clinic. Um, you can ask a geneticist <laughs> there um, and they can look at your genetic report and, and tell you for certain um, whether or not your, your uh, other children have a risk of having a child with Angelman syndrome. So this question is about Gabax, uh, I can never say it, Gabax at all, right? Did I say it right? Yeah. Um, the question basically is, is it possible to, skip my, to still get my child on? And from what I understand, this is still in trials, correct? Yeah, it's, it's my understanding it's still in trials. Um, they're in Neptune, right, which is a phase three mm -hmm. clinical trial. Um, and so um, I think you should reach out to the, the folks at, at Ovid and, and ask. And then I think we have time maybe for one or two more, if you have just a few more minutes. Um, sure. the, the question is, you know, let the, I'll, I'll try to rephrase this question or try to make it smaller. But the question around is, let's say one of these ASOs is, shows a therapeutic recovery or does some, is, is showing some sort of improvement. What type of research or what type of work will still do you think need to be done even mm -hmm. after that? Is that a question you can answer? Yeah, you know what? That's a wonderful question and and one that um, I think a lot about because, well, I think a lot about this question because um, it, restoring UBE3A um, isn't necessarily going to work exactly the same for everybody, right? Um, kids will be treated at different ages. Um, and so it's it's probably going to fix different things depending on the age, the child, so on and so forth, how it um, goes through the brain and whatnot, a lot of different variables. So what's going to, there's a, there's a really good likelihood that these therapies are going to change what Angelman syndrome looks like. It's, it's not necessarily going to all of a sudden make your child completely typical, but um, we hope it gives substantial improvement, but, um, but there's prob it's going to change the, the natural history of Angelman syndrome. And, and that was kind of why it was so important to collect the natural history data beforehand and why Roche is carrying out their Freesia study is because they wanna know what Angelman syndrome looks like before these therapies get out there and, and are widely used. So it's gonna change the course. So we're gonna have a different disorder to study um, after the treatments and there's going to be um, uh, challenges or deficits or something that um, are probably going to be differently important to you guys after your child has had one of these therapies. And, um, and so we're going to be poised to listen to you and, and, and listen and find out um, what are the most meaningful things we need to help with um, and, and try to move research there too. This is just happen happening with um, spinal muscular atrophy that had one of these mm -hmm. transformative cures and, and they have a whole different disorder to look at now. So um, I, it's all of our learning about UBE3A and Angelman syndrome is going to pay off. It's going to be important to have this knowledge, um, have this knowledge base as we move forward. Absolutely. Well, we've taken tons of your time already, and uh, the questions, we, we got to most of the questions. There's a few more questions, but what we'll do is we will make sure to get these questions to Stormy and get them out in a PDF along with her webinar tonight. So if you want to share this with your family or your friends to help to give them a chance to help understand, I know that I always have um, family and friends asking me about the research of it all. And I'm always like, oh, I, you know, I, how long do you have? And can you just listen to this webinar? So we will have that um, for you. But thank you so much, Stormy, um, for your continued work and com continued passion for Angelman syndrome. I would say if you could just kind of wrap up your part by just saying maybe one thing that you're super hopeful and excited about for this community. Mm. Um. I'm super hopeful and excited because, uh, y you know, you guys are in a really envious position. Uh, you have a single gene disorder that there are some viable therapeutics already for. You have multiple shots on goal, to use another sports analogy. You have multiple shots on goal. Um, and and um, I think probably a lot of them are going to hit. And you guys are going to have some difficult choices ahead of you, but some wonderful choices ahead of you. Um, and it's going to be um, nothing but good things for your kids. You have a lot of great pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies working for you. Um, and, and so having this interest in your disorder is really promising. And, um, you know, I, I'm, it makes me proud because I know that the basis 
our, our investments in research from very early on asking the basic questions are really paying off now. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's a perfect way to end it. We are all very hopeful and we're all very determined. I'll use that um, <laughs> to continue to work hard for this community and for um, for all these amazing individuals with Angelman syndrome. So um, thank you. I, I see things popping up on the question, the question box. Thank you, Stormy. We love you, Stormy. You're amazing, Stormy. Uh -huh. um, all those, uh, you know, all those uh, great um, accolades for you, Stormy. Thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate you. Thank you for everyone that was to join us tonight. We really hope that you're enjoying the virtual Palooza. I know I'm enjoying being with you guys every evening. Don't forget tomorrow night we have Dr. Becky Burdine. I hope you guys all have an amazing evening and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.